the long-term vision for the industry is bringing crowdfunding to the point where it is something that happens regularly or more often than not alongside VCs. That can work already as the industry mm-hmm. exists. There doesn't need to be a whole lot of change for that. And that's something I would put in our even medium to long-term vision of transitioning from we've educated an army of investors. Everyone's super into this. Everyone's very knowledgeable. They know what they're doing. They know how to spot red flags and they take a really rationed, reasonable approach. And now, okay, we can invest together and operate as a quasi venture fund, you know, as a group of people in crowdfunding. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Next Big Thing HQ, where we interview founders and showcase startups raising capital via Reg CF. Today, we have a special guest with you. We have an individual who will give you the tools to put you in the top 20% of venture knowledge. We have the co-founder and head of product of Dorio Venture Labs, Dan Deflin. Dan, welcome onto the pod. Thanks, Connor. Excited to be here. Yeah, and I'm excited to have you on. And I kind of want to start with the mission of Dorio Venture Labs. I really like the mission, but there's something specific about within the mission statement that I find really interesting. And the mission is to provide the tools to put you in the top 20% of venture knowledge. So why is there a focus on the 20% number? Why is that kind of the benchmark, the standard? Why not just say, put you an average at 50%, 50, 75%? Yeah, well, I think no one wants to be in the top 70%, right? That's kind of the, almost the whole population. You could simplify it even further and say the top tier, right? But it's kind of nice to put a number on it. Also, I think at the core of it kind of breaks down to that Pareto principle, right? Which Mm -hmm. you see in nature, science, um, but also you talk about it a lot in venture capital and startup investing, right? Where the top 20% or only 20% of your investments or your companies are going to generate 80% of all the gains, right? And that's kind of the seemingly natural law of nature. So it seemed like a good number to put on it, but I think you could simplify it really down to, hey, the top tier and the only... Like the only, to really make money, I think in this industry and make a difference if you're coming at it from either profit or just trying to make an impact, you really have to know what you're doing from the knowledge standpoint. You're taking on a lot of risk if you're just going in blind, right? And so really we want to elevate elevate people up to that top tier and really set them up for great performance over the long term. Yeah. And I think the knowledge aspect is super important because especially investing in startups, if you don't know what you're investing in, it's kind of hard to make a good investment, right? right? So understanding that knowledge and with Dorio Venture Labs, What I love is you provide knowledge for the investor, also for the founders, and then for the entrepreneurs who are just really interested in the space, might become an investor, might become a founder, but they don't know yet. So when we look at what Dorio Venture Labs provides, they provide a toolbox and there's four main products. There's a fantasy startup. There's the qualified accreditor investor course and certification, right? Nice, nice. Got my coffee here too. (laughs) And then there's equity Bible. And the last one is the Dorio Adventure Club. So let's talk first about the fantasy startup. Fantasy startup, what is it? And then who is it targeting? For sure. So I'd say broadly, anyone interested in startups, it's a great tool for. Fantasy startup is a real-to-life investing simulation. We've taken 50 companies from real life that have already gone through their life cycle from being founded, going through raising capital, either exiting or failing. Most of them fail, spoiler alert. Really what we're trying to do is, you know, we've taken those companies from real life, condensed their storylines down from years, say like seven years to Mm -hmm. seven days in the game. What we do is we give you $500 of in-game play capital and let you go through all 50 companies, make an invest pass decision, almost like you're a a shark on Shark Tank. We're looking at really the core pillars and the principles of what you should be looking at in a deal. What do they do? What's the product, the team, the market, the risks, valuation, you decide to invest or not. And then you can follow each company and build their portfolio and track it as it moves, as each of them move through the life cycle, or do you get chances to reinvest just like you would in, if you're a VC in real life. Ultimately, what we're trying to do there is give you the opportunity to take on risk without actually putting money on the line, right? And get those experiences and both of what it feels like to make money, but more importantly, in a lot of ways, lose money without actually losing your capital over the span of like seven years, for example. You can do that over two weeks in the game and start to understand, okay, what is actually important here as I build a portfolio? How do I avoid loss in real life? And how do I more importantly make money doing this over the long term in real life? Yeah. And it's using the simulation. So you learn from your mistakes that you made in the simulation so that you don't make it when you're investing thousands of dollars into these startups. And what I love is that you're getting this fantasy startup into universities to adopt in their entrepreneurial focused classes. Shout out Clemson. Clemson's <laughs> Business School, they use the fantasy startup. Kelly Business School at Indiana uses it. And you have three other universities. So 
what is the, just curious from more of a, a founder perspective, what is the kind of process you're going through to get these universities to adopt fantasy startup in their curriculum? Because I would imagine it's mm-hmm. relatively difficult. It is difficult. I, I think we probably underestimated how difficult it would be. I think sales in into university environments. I mean, it's just an, anyone who's had experience in university sales probably will tell you the first thing. It's a very slow process. So mm-hmm. it takes time, right? Because professors yeah. understandably plan out their lesson plans or curriculum months, if not years in advance, and can kind of be hesitant to bring in new tools, right? Especially if they themselves don't have particular experience with them. So that's why we're really grateful for the professors who have adopted it. Again, shout out Kelly, shout out Clemson, our other schools we're working with, taking that leap and implementing it in their class. What I think resonates with a lot of professors, particularly entrepreneurship and business school professors who we're primarily working with, is if they're teaching entrepreneurship, they themselves are in a lot of ways early adopters and they can appreciate what we're doing. But also, I think especially if these professors have their own experience with investing in, in real life, they can kind of resonate with what we're trying to teach essentially in the game. And I think students especially, and anyone, a young professional, recent grads, anything like that, they're the ones who have the most to benefit from right? that long time horizon of investing. If you're someone in retirement, you might be interested in startups for fun, but you're not necessarily thinking about it as a wealth building opportunity. Younger professionals and students have that long time horizon to one, make an impact, but two, use it as a wealth building opportunity over time. So I think professors understand that, but that long sales cycle of university certainly is a challenge. Yeah. I was talking to Professor Hudgens and he was just, he couldn't stop raving about how much he loved the fantasy startup product and how much his students loved it too. And it kind of goes back to the best way to learn is through games. And so, mm-hmm. especially younger kids, like students, young 23 year olds, right? If, if I can learn through a game, I'm going to learn so much more than kind of really having to read or even sit in a class and like listen to a lecture. That's what I find really exciting. The fact that the feedback was so good and so high and he can't wait to, you know, roll it off in mm-hmm. next semester. That was and awesome. Just talking to shout him out, and getting shout this out feedback. To him, by the way, Professor Hudgens, he's the best. And yeah, we've really enjoyed working with him and his students are all great and really ambitious and we're just really into startups, you know, and entrepreneurship, whether from wanting to be founders or, or on the investor side, which is really cool. So goes both ways. Can't speak highly enough about uh, him and, and the program over there. Yep. And so that's the investor side product focusing on mm-hmm. the investor. Now, if we focus on the founder, you have the equity Bible, which is really designed to help what educate the founder, first time founders on how to raise capital. Absolutely. Yes. That was written by my co-founder, Jerry Hayes, the first time founders equity Bible, which by the way, if you go to Dorio.com, that's free to download. You can get a digital copy. We're do- offering that in partnership with Elevate Ventures, that venture firm based in Indiana. Yeah. So the equity Bible, just like you said, it's trying to help founders avoid all the common pitfalls that a first time founder might make, whether it's giving too much equity away or not structuring equity the correct way, how you approach the finance round with setting terms with a, a VC who might not know what they're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, there's obviously a lot of ways that can go wrong. So easy read. It's you can probably sit down and read it in two to three hours, but it will help you avoid all the common pitfalls that a founder runs into. And I think it's a really effective educational tool for founders and investors, frankly, um, but especially a founder. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like Murphy's Law, right? Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So you right. might as well get prepared and understand, you know, everything that can happen. That way you have a plan. Worst comes to worse. Absolutely. And I would say that kind of underpins our entire philosophy with everything we do and build in here at Dorio. Like, more education is never a bad thing, right? Mm-hmm. You're only going to benefit from yep. uh, preparing yourself. Even if something that you read in that book or something through a programming that you learn, even if it never comes up in your actual founder or investor career, it might, <laughs> and it's yeah. only going to benefit you from taking that in. It might change the way you think about something that leads to something else that, that's great, you know? Yeah. And especially if you're investing thousands of dollars, right? It's one bad mistake can cost you a lot of money. There's a lot more risk when investing in a higher amounts you know, compared to, I don't know, just buying like a Coke stock for $60. So I got a little ahead of my skis. I want to (laughs) rewind and talk about more of your story. And then how did you meet your co-founder, Jerry? And kind of the backstory behind that. Yeah. So my co-founder, Jerry, it's not the usual kind of co-founder pairing meetup story. It's great. I love it. It, So Jerry was my venture capital entrepreneurship professor at IU Kelly a bunch of years back. So he was my professor. He is a longtime entrepreneur, longtime investor. He's had multiple, multiple companies that he's founded and, and exited from. And so he was always talking about in our classes, both teaching kind of the core principles of venture capital, but also talking higher level about this theme of how do we get more access for 
younger retail mm-hmm. investors in this industry because as someone who's seen it from the inside, he knows how life-changing it can be for people long-term. How do we get younger people into it more? And so he's always kind of thinking for better part of 20 years on, on this topic. And the more he talks about it in class, the more interested I became, went to office hours and asked, if there's any kind of way to get involved? How do we move this thing forward? And kind of from that paired up and really kind of from there pushed Dorio into education focused firm, really trying to, again, lead with a wedge of education. I think that's the only way you can get broader adoption, broader interest mm-hmm. in the industry is that people understand what they're doing. So yeah, that's how we initially met. And Fantasy Startup was our first product that came out of that. Came out of a lot of kind of adjacent, similar activities we were doing in class. Like my final my final exam, my senior year in this class was kind of like an in-person version of what we do in Fantasy Startup. So just kind of naturally developed from there. Yeah, that's awesome. And then talking about, you know, democratizing access for retail investors to invest in startups with the equity crowdfunding industry. When you look at it right now, what are your perspectives and kind of what you see that you really like in the industry and what you see that, there's room to improve going forward. It's a lot. I mean, we could spend we could spend an hour, if not more, talking about just that. First and foremost, I mean, I, I love the fact that prior to 2014, 2015, with the passing of the Jobs Act, there literally was no option for mm-hmm. retail investors or people who are not accredited to get involved. And so the fact that it exists in the first place, that people like you and I can just go on, we fund her or Republic Start Engine, any one of the other platforms and actually start investing in companies that take your company Uber. to the next big thing, right? Yeah. Try to find the next Uber. I think that's amazing. And it's only going to get better as far as the number of companies, the quality of companies, the types of companies we're seeing. So first and foremost, that is what I think excites me the most and what I appreciate most. What I'd say room for improvement and kind of what I, I think we're working on here is I think it feels like a lot of people are kind of out doing their own thing, trying mm-hmm. to invest, which can be a as we've heard from firsthand experience with customers, like a very daunting task to go on WeFunder, rouse around, find a company that one, sounds interesting to you, and then start to dive in and understand, is this a good deal or not? Am I getting the full picture? And then knowing that you have to build out a whole portfolio. So continuously so doing that over time, it can be very overwhelming. So I think if I had to sum it up simply, better organization and community built around this space will help investor retention and probably avoid some of the pitfalls that come from trying to invest on your own for most people. Yeah, and you brought up the point earlier, there aren't any subreddits really for right. equity crowdfunding investors, which is pretty weird. I know Caleb Nasus, he has a, a Facebook group, but I'll be honest, I don't use Facebook. <laughs> I deleted it a, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's pretty weird that there's no subreddit group. And I think on the average, there's more than like a million dollars committed capital per day. So there's a lot of money being committed yep. every single day in this industry, but there's no unified community other than the Facebook group, but I don't use Facebook. You don't use Facebook. There's definitely an opportunity. And I think it would help all the investors and future investors to have a community where you can start bouncing ideas, talking about it and sharing, going back to your original point, just sharing the knowledge, the importance of having this knowledge and how daunting of a task it is for first time investors to one, know what to look for, two, then judge if that's a good metric or not because you don't have any comparables because this is your first time doing it. Right. So you're trying to do that with Dorio Venture Labs, so, right? So we are, yeah. And the, the thing I'd say on that is if anyone comes across a Reg CF, I'd be crowdfunding subreddit at the active, let me know. I want to be involved <laughs> in that, you know? For all the things I don't like about something like Wall Street bets, I don't think that's a great place to go for the average investor. <laughs> mm. I personally wouldn't take part, but they have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of active users who are involved sharing mm-hmm. Their knowledge, I guess you could call it. It's risky behavior, obviously, but that's an active community. I don't think we see something like that in equity crowdfunding, despite, like you said, how much money there is flowing into it. So I think, yeah, that certainly is a better piece. That's something we're trying to, to build better community around all our products. And we have an active and growing Discord community as well. And it's really cool to see, especially recently, a lot more activity of people mm. just dropping in. It's totally free to be in the community and someone dropping in, hey, what do you think about XYZ deal on WeFunder and they drop the link in and people can give, a, of course, it's not financial advice, right? But they can give an opinion of, you know, th- this is something I like about it. I don't quite get this or I don't quite like this. That, at least at a very small level, you can build a lot of stuff off of that, but at least at a small level, like that's the type of thing we need to really foster community, which is good for investors. Obviously, you can get second opinions. But it's also good for the platform. It's good for founders right where you have people who are staying in this space, committing capital frequently, not just in one deal and then disappearing forever, you know, which I think is a problem that the industry deals with 
to a certain extent right now. So I think on the first point, the community helps really get the fight wheel going yeah. where there's more active people are talking about it more. They're interested more because now they can, you know, ping ideas off one another and, you know, see the different perspectives. I always find that exciting. And I think that's part of the reason that makes Wall Street Bets such an active, you know, subreddit yeah. just because like you go in there, all right, yeah, there might be nine bad ideas out of 10. Right. But then there's <laughs> one good idea where you're like, that makes a lot of sense. I really like that. And Which then is kind of like community. startups anyway, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think constantly getting those perspectives and even seeing, well, I don't agree with that perspective, but I don't agree mm-hmm. because of like A, B, and C. That helps you kind of really mold what your thesis, what your fundamentals are with investing going forward. And I also think too, you know, we're still in the first inning. I think, oh, I want to speed it up, speed it up. It needs to grow faster, but it's like, it takes time to really grow an industry. It takes time and also, again, I'm biased, of course, because we approach this from the lens of education. But I think there's something to be said for slow, steady, and responsible growth as mm-hmm. well. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. It, look I, at I crypto. Think, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> gosh, I, we're <laughs> writing something about that in our, our newsletter for today, actually, where over the past couple of weeks, you see tokens on Solana with names <laughs> that I will repeat live here, <laughs> with, you know, <laughs> getting people their whole annual salaries worth in one random risky trade over the course of an hour, like you can see how people would find that appealing to do, but certainly don't condone it. <laughs> but more often than not, people will get burned by that. And the same mm-hmm. is, tr- is true in equity crowdfunding and startups generally, I think, where someone will come in, maybe they find a deal they really are interested in on WeFunder and think, this is the next Uber, I'm going all in on this. And then one of two things happen. They either get burnt and they learn their lesson, but it, it hurts a lot. Or two, mm-hmm. they get burnt and they leave forever. They never come back to the platform. They never fund another mm-hmm. company. And they also tell all their friends and family, do not do this. Yeah. I got hurt on this, right? Which is devastating for the industry. So we can avoid that by any means possible. I think slow and steady growth is probably the way to go. And it, it is tough because startups often fail. Often is probably mm-hmm. an understatement. You know, 90% yeah. of startups usually fail. And when you're investing in startups, it kind of goes back to the power law, which we were talking about somewhere to the like 80-20 principle where, mm-hmm. you know, there's only going to be a handful of your bets that are really going to pay off and they're going to pay off massively. But most of your yeah. bets are going to fail. And you have to have that understanding when in making these investments. And then by having that understanding, that's when you can then figure out how to construct a portfolio so that you can cater towards, you know, only a handful are going to succeed. But you have to make sure you bet on the winners or the ones that have high potential because there's only going to be a handful that succeed. So I think there's that interesting dynamic too where you really have to teach people and educate people. This is kind of how this industry works. And when you invest in it, this is the investment process. And you're not going to see a return probably for seven years. Yeah. Maybe 10, right? Which is tough. And one of the challenges I think we're dealing with too is how do you overcome that instant gratification Mm -hmm. culture and that mindset, which again, you can totally understand. Back to the Solana token trading. Again, I don't condone it. I don't have an interest in it myself, but you can see why someone would want to make a lot of money in a very short amount of time. Whereas the opposite, which is what is, I think, required for success in startups is, hey, I know I'm not going to see my money maybe for seven to 10 years. I have to be comfortable that on the surface, it's not as appealing. I think once you get into that mindset, it's kind of nice. Like, hey, I can set it and forget it. I don't have to worry about it so much as long as I'm not investing more than I can afford to lose. I don't know what the easiest way, frankly, to help get people in that mindset beyond just, you know, Education. getting them in a community or providing them with tools where they can start to experience it with no risk, you know. I think it just goes back to uh, giving them a good framework, you know, put this money aside, don't look at it for 10 years and then see how it's doing. Because a lot of times too, like when VCs have funds, there's a J curve, right? So like for the first four years, it's negative. And then after that, right. then it shoots up and, you know, you can't look at it like crypto where you're checking it every minute right. to see if it goes up or down, right? It's a right. startup. It takes time to build. Maybe check on it once a quarter. That's where hopefully you can get updates from the founders. I think that's a big issue too. Yeah. And then, you know, having that just framework and that expectation that, all right, after 10 years, that's how I'm going to judge this investment. I'm not going to judge it after, you know, first month, first year, first couple of years. Yeah. But talking about education, you have the qualified accredited investor. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about What's the goal with the Qualified Accredited Investor course and then certification? Our moonshot goal is how do we change the accredited investor rule? And I'm sure a lot of people listening will either already be familiar with the accredited investor rule or will soon learn about it and not be very happy. 
it's basically the rule that if you're not a millionaire, not including your home, if you're not wealthy, basically you can't invest freely in private markets or all the startups out there exclusive of equity crowdfunding, of course. So really the SEC's only standard for that right now is based on wealth. There's really no other reasonable alternative. There's a small education path for people who work in the finance industry. Like if you take the FINRA's Series yeah. 7, Series 82, 65 exams, but you actually have to work in finance for that to apply. So it's not accessible. The long-term mission of again, QAI, thanks for wrapping the manual. It's a 140 page manual course, kind of covering modules anywhere from structuring deals, SEC regulation, how you value companies, how you build portfolios, all really in depth. I'd call it like an MBA or a 400 level course. And it all culminates in a hundred question, three hour online exam that we would liken to a FINRA exam, that standard. And so really what we're aiming for, this is kind of like a driver's license test. You can imagine kind of a two-part exam, this being like your practical, you're in class written, and then fantasy startup passing that being kind of the, like the road test, right? And if you can do that, if you can prove that you understand at a very high level what you're doing in the private markets, we've proposed this to the SEC for consideration be, to be approved as a education-based alternative to that accredited investor wealth definition. So that's the long-term mission, you know, dealing with the SEC, government agencies obviously takes time. So we're not there yet on that. But in the meantime, this course we put together, we are very confident, really levels up your knowledge. So it's applicable for anybody, again, if you're a founder or an investor, just looking to perform very well in venture capital and actually succeed. That's what, what we put this course together for. And so right now is cohort two, right? Cohort two, that's right. Cohort two, let's go. And how many people are in cohort two? Cohort two, we've got a 22 people in this cohort. So we're keeping them small. Obviously, I think that's kind of how the best insights are generated. Mm -hmm. We have two paths, by the way. One is kind of the self-guided path. So if you want to just go get a copy of the book, learn at your own pace, and then take the, the exam and go through all that kind of on your own time, that's a path. We also have the cohort path, which is what you're in right now. And that kind of adds office hours with the team, weekly sessions, which are super beneficial. Two hours on Friday, we break the content down in kind of lecture form, but more conversational form, like getting people to bring their own perspectives and insights to, for example, how you approach valuation, right? So when you're approaching a company and considering is this a fairly priced deal or not, or maybe you're setting terms in your own angel group for a deal, right? How do you go about that with kind of a methodical, almost scientific-like approach to make it, I think, very reasonable and fair for all sides? And just bouncing ideas off each other, which I think is, again, we talked about building community, I think a super effective way to learn and then also build people's confidence. So we had 50 people in cohort number one. Yeah, we'll probably hold one per quarter moving forward. Okay. All right. So then I'm assuming the next one will probably open up somewhere around April for cohort yeah, three? Yeah, um, probably. We'll probably go mid-May for the for okay. cohort number three. Yeah. Mid-May. And then let's talk about the roadmap, just thinking about the destination of getting the SEC to pass this as a way to become an accredited investor. What kind of needs to happen along that roadmap to get to that destination? For sure. So I think the biggest thing is kind of groundswell adoption. That's where we're really trying to kind of broaden the tent right now and get a lot of adoption, a lot of people through the program and, and more importantly, educated, showing that hey, this program not only works, but it's incredibly effective and people are not only feeling very confident, but they're actually influencing this in real life and in their own investing, in their portfolios. So that's what, what I think we need to show to make it happen. Obviously, we're not expecting this to be a, a short-term thing, but I think the market momentum is hopefully on our side. We've seen in past year, two bills now come through House of Representatives that are either pushing the SEC to approve new standards to the accredited investor rule or open up an education-based path. So I think that's, again, slow, yes. slow going. But I think it, ultimately it will happen. It's just a matter of when. So in the meantime, the more adoption and improvement, honestly, we can get on the program, we'll make that, you know, all the more likely. Kind of creating enough noise to where Congress starts noticing, right? And they're like, exactly. hey, this kind of makes sense. And you mentioned to become an accredited investor, basically you have to be a millionaire, but that excludes the net worth from owning your house, right? Right. You know, the average American, 70% of their net worth comes from their house. Right. So you think about that, that in itself, like just excluding your house probably eliminates a good 60% of America, 70% of America, just because they have so much net worth in yeah. their house. And that's the main asset that they own. So 
I definitely think that there needs to be another way to prove you're an accredited investor. And I mean, we talked about this, you know, you can get a driver's license to test that you can drive a car. Why can't you take a test that just shows that you're sophisticated? Yeah, exactly. The net worth, th this is something that I think anyone who thinks about it or talks about it will say, yeah, the, the rule makes no sense. Net worth has little to no correlation to actual financial knowledge or performance. Mm -hmm. All it means is that you can suffer a loss and be fine if you have a have millions in the bank. I don't know if that's a great standard to be promoting. So I, we do think there's a better way. And also the SEC, I don't know if you've seen this or not, Congress is going one way. They're saying, hey, you should be putting some other standards in place that are financially based. SEC is going the other way and they're actually proposing as of December, 2023, increasing that limit from a million dollars up to $3 million to adjust really? inflation, if not <laughs> higher. 3 million, if not higher, maybe 5 million. Because the accredited investor rule was first put in place in 1982. And that okay. was when they set the million dollar limit, not again, not including your home. And so they're saying because of inflation, eventually everybody's going to be accredited just based off of a million dollar net worth. Mm -hmm. and so they want to bump that up to 3 million, which our friends over at the Angel Capital Association, the ACA, they put out a study pretty soon after that report came out saying, if that happens, 60% of all currently accredited investors would be cut out. So if you think yeah. about, because the, the more precise example would be, you might be accredited if you have $2 million, but if you have to go up to three, then you're not accredited, right? And so that would cut out obviously a massive amount of capital for startups. So it wouldn't be a good move for the industry. And that's why we think if they do that, the only thing that makes sense is an education-based path where, okay, put it up to 3 million if you want, but make something a little more accessible for everybody else that actually promotes good financial habits, good financial knowledge, yeah. which they, I think is a fairly responsible way to go about it. Well, they have the education path, but it's only accessible to people in finance. And you have to right. get sponsored by a bank. So that's what I don't understand. You already have this path where you can take the FINRA, you can take the Series 7. You're going to get the title of being an accredited investor, but it's only accessible to those who work at banks and then get sponsored by a bank. Why can't we just offer to anyone who's willing to put in the time and the effort to like study for a material or a course and pass a tough test? You know, exactly. that's it. And we talk about the democratization of investing in startups. You know, why don't we really make that happen with also, you know, being able to have courses, have certifications yeah. that prove you're an accredited investor. So I, yeah. I think it will happen. I think it's, like you said, a matter of time, a matter of when. Yeah. Again, I think, like you said, the more noise we make, the more people are going to listen. I've heard very few people argue in favor of the credit invest rule, or mm -hmm. at least be, maybe they think it's a good thing, but they add the caveat that there should be some other option. So I think everyone kind of agrees on it, just as with a lot of things that doesn't always translate immediately into policy. So yeah, it's a matter of when we're going to keep pushing forward and, and try to drive that change. So any support is obviously massively appreciated. And uh, I think we'll make that change. It's just a matter of time. Uh, when we talk about kind of it's investing sophistication, you talk to a lot of individuals, a lot of investors, a lot of founders. So we'll start with the first question. What is the common misconception that you see investors have when it comes to investing in startups? A couple of things. I think maybe the most common one is that it's super risky, which like, of course, of course it is. Mm -hmm. Talked about it. We said it's nine yeah. out of 10 startups fail on the fourth of this call. But I think if you can implement good systems, if you know where you're, where you know the common red flags, you know the pitfalls, mm -hmm. you know how to structure a portfolio, to benefit from that power law, it's not as risky as people think if you're looking over a long enough time frame. because again, you only need that one company to your losses back, if not more than that, right? So it's risky, but you can go about it in a risky way. On the other side of things, I think there's a lot of talk about finding the next Uber, which is yeah. true, but I think people can go a little bit overboard on that. Maybe not quite the Wall Street bets side of things, but the reality is I think now currently the next Uber is still probably going to come from a massive BC firm that are going to snatch them up, you know? And so I think that'll change in a matter of years and capital shifting it over and over. And that's kind of my bullish case for equity crowdfunding is that it makes way more sense to raise from your community rather than spending a year trying to raise from VCs, right? So I think that will change. But right now, I think people can also go a little bit overboard on, this is going to be the next Uber. I'm putting all my money in this company, yeah, which yeah. is not a good thing to do. Yep. Or just seeing any company that's an AI company and investing in it just because of all the hype. Yeah. When in reality, Absolutely. you know, just... There are some great AI companies, but again, yeah, with anything, there's always hype. And that's yeah. something we talked about recently in probably our QAI cohort session last week is learning when to say no. I think the thing about startups generally, but especially in crowdfunding, is 
you're not going to get your pick of all the best companies. And so you're, you might find an AI company that's raising money and people might invest on, okay, well, this is the only chance I get to go in on AI. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's quite the right way to approach it. You still have to know when to say no, look at it objectively, like agnostic of whatever industry it's in. Is this a good deal? Can I potentially make money on this deal? And there's a lot of factors that go into that. So I think chasing the hype, like you said, generally is probably not the best bet. And I'd like to kind of throw a little caveat in there. Instead of like just saying no, I like it better for framework wise of saying mm. not yet, where it's, yeah. I'm not completely shutting it off, but not yet because I have certain metrics that it needs to hit, whether it's right. pre-revenue and I think it's too risky. Okay. I like the company. I like the team, but not yet. Right. right? I love we'll Think about it again. And I've heard a lot of VCs kind of talk about that framework when they tell mm. founders. I feel like that's a really good way of not completely burning the bridge, mm. but also yeah. knowing these are your metrics, these are your standards, and you can't stoop below just because you're excited or there's hype, or maybe you're in yeah. the scarcity mindset of afraid you're going to miss it. Just having the not yet, it's like, we'll see what uh, happens later. If it's okay with you, I'm going to steal that framework. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that a lot better. No, I think you've changed my perspective on that for sure. In our newsletter going on today, I'm going to change some wording around to reflect that. the not yet. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll make sure to give you credit for that. <laughs> I, I like that a lot. And I think it speaks to kind of the, the mindset that you have to have to find success in this industry of, like you said, not burning bridges, staying open to ideas. Like that, mm -hmm. the whole point of investing in startups is in a lot of ways to kind of be at the cutting edge and help bring the future into reality. I don't think you get that if you're going to be completely binary and yes, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. You have to be open to possibilities and that's a pretty cool thing about it. So uh, yeah, I love that. No, to and, not yet. I like that. Yeah. I figure if that really helps me kind of not make a decision because I don't want to say no, but I can say not yet. I'm sure that mm -hmm. can help a lot of other people really get over that hurdle of closing off a decision for later, kind of saying, we're just going to close the door, but kind of keep it shut a little bit for maybe the next round. But I do want to talk to you about, I have this vision for equity crowdfunding that I think will happen, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but a couple of years down the road, I forget what startup was doing it, but I think there's going to be bigger and bigger startups that when they raise maybe like a series B, a series C, even a series A, they're going to allocate some money for mm -hmm. the crowd to invest. So I saw one startup, it was raising a $25 million round and set aside 5 million for equity crowdfunding. And then the other 20 million, they raised VC money. And I think that's a super fascinating idea where you combine yeah. like equity crowdfunding. So you get the crowd behind and you get your uh, supporters, you know, consumers to t become investors and then become advocates. So that's the flywheel going to really help get your product out there. But then you also get the VC capital too. So you can get some yeah. of their expertise, some of their connections to help grow and really scale your startup. And I don't know yeah. what you think about idea. I don't know if you really see that working in the future. Kind of wanted to throw that idea yeah. your way and see what you think. I love it. That's kind of a very similar vision to what we see. I think I would add maybe the caveat that I think it'll go even mm -hmm. earlier or uh, like based on what we see in our community and what yeah. types of deals people like, they love earlier stage deals generally, at least the members we have. And so I think it's amazing. Like, WeFunders done a great job of bringing in companies like Substack. I think they brought in last year to to do a round like that where they allocated a certain amount for crowdfunding. I think even earlier, like if you're investing alongside a pre-seed fund or a, a seed fund, I think it works at all stages, frankly. And I definitely see that vision. One of the frameworks we like to think about, especially in our Dorio Venture Club community as we're looking at crowdfunding deals, is is this company coming in with external capital? Like, are we investing mm -hmm. with a VC or an angel or whoever? Or is this, are they coming to us basically because there's nowhere else to go? And that's a pretty gross oversimplification, but I think it can be a helpful framework of like when you do see a deal where they're raising around for VCs and that's a great positive signal. Doesn't mean it's going to work out, but it's a really great positive signal. Yeah. So it's a green I, flag. Absolutely. Absolutely. And every startup is going to have green flags. They're going to have red flags. It's what balance do you want to tolerate, you know? Yep. So yeah, I 100% agree with that vision. And I think it works at every stage of funding. Now let's pivot to what is your vision for the next five to 10 years for Dorio Venture Labs? What do you see? You can do super ambitious envision and kind of what you're expecting along the way and what kind of gets you really excited to get up in the morning and to really work towards it. What gets me very excited to work on, on what we're doing is one the community. Like we, we talked about that, I think missing community piece. So it's inspiring, honestly, to, to wake up and see messages in our community discord of people just bouncing ideas off each other and sharing experiences like that gets me going. That's awesome. 
Secondly, I think, and this is more kind of the long-term vision, is exactly what we, we just talked about and what you mentioned is kind of your vision for the industry is bringing crowdfunding to the point where it is something that happens regularly or more often than not alongside VCs. That can work already as the industry mm-hmm. exists. There doesn't need to be a whole lot of change for that. And that's something I would put in our long-term, even like medium to long-term vision of transitioning from, okay, we are, we, we've educated an army of investors. Everyone's super into this. Everyone's very knowledgeable. They know what they're doing. They know how to spot red flags and they take a really rationed, reasonable approach. And now, okay, we can invest together, you know, and kind of off, operate as a, a quasi venture fund as our, you know, as a group of people in crowdfunding. So that's what I see as the long-term vision for us. It's what gets me the most excited. And yeah, I think brings a lot of positive energy. Love it. Love it. We'll do a couple rapid questions. What sure. is your favorite book? Most influential book that, you know, you think and you're like, ah, oh, that was a really good book that really changed how I think, really got me excited for let's do like the entrepreneurial journey. Well, the, the cliche business answer would be zero to one. Peter Thiel zero to one. It is cliche, but I think it worse. Mm-hmm. Fiction wise, regular book. This may not be business related at all. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Two hundred really? year old book. Yeah. Maybe I was in high school reading that and you know, it's one of those formative times where you read something. But it hit me for some reason as very an inspirational, you know, man's quest for improvement and the toll it takes on a person, you know, positive and negative, which I, th- I think is pretty fascinating. So you were the president of the rugby team. So what is one thing <laughs> you learned from that? That you're now implementing going forward, head of product and co-founder of Doria yeah. Venture Labs. Trying to create research, by the way. Well, uh, <laughs> I'd say trying to delegate, finding good people to help you out along the way, because yeah. there's always a lot of work to go around. And how do you make do with limited resources? We were a club yeah. rugby team, not a ton of support from university. You kind of have to do stuff on your own, like fundraise by moving mini fridges into, in and out of the dorms of the semester. <laughs> which is the worst job I've ever had in my life, but <laughs> you got to make it happen, right? So yeah. how do you put your head down, work with the team and make something happen with very limited resources? Love that answer. And then Venture Weekend, tell us more about Venture Weekend and for the listeners, you know, why should they be excited? When's it going to happen? Yeah. So Venture Weekend is something we can put on for any group or organization kind of as, as needed. So we don't have one, say, plan for our company, though we would should, but it's something we put on for groups going over the course of two days, kind of like a startup accelerator weekend, but from the investor side. So come in, pair it up in groups of three or four. Everyone comes up with a business pitch idea. Then you go through that round of pitch idea. Some people are designated as the investors, the VCs, Mm. and they decide to invest or not. People that don't get picked, they get eliminated, they become investors, and it just continues on in rounds and rounds until basically one company is the winner. One company exits over the course of after two days, basically. It's a very fun live in-person experience. It's a very fun learning experience. It's been rebuilding things. So yeah, absolutely. If that sounds of interest to your community, group, school, anything like that, that's something we love to put on. It's a, it's a great time. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So, well, Dan, I appreciate you coming on. Where can people find you and where can they find the toolbox products for Dorio Venture Labs? Yeah, so you can find our company on Twitter. We're at Dorio VC. LinkedIn as well, just search Dorio Venture Labs. Our website for the toolbox is dorio.com. That's D-O-R-I-O-T.com. Yeah, so we have a free download, the Bible, as well as links to all our other tools and resources. Um, that'd be the best place. Yep. And then last plug, I promise I'm not paid, but I just really <laughs> love this book. The Qualified Accredited Investor, you know, of course, I recommend it, especially if you're going to be investing money. You need to get the knowledge. Highly recommend it. You break it down so that it's knowledgeable, but it's not overwhelming. And you can really go through the modules and pace yourself as you go through the modules and learn a lot and apply for the next cohort. So Dan, as always, thank you for coming on. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Connor. This was a lot of fun. We'll have to do this again. Yep. Love to. And for all the listeners out there, we'll see you next time on Next Big Thing HQ. So long.